So today's topic I begin as principles of zero diagnosis of fungal infections. So during our journey with this uh, zero diagnosis lecture, we also have uh, videos for very important zero diagnostic techniques, which can be uh, performed in any laboratory uh, with a uh, few resources. Uh, may not be too many, but few resources are definitely required for performing zero diagnosis. So let us see the importance of zero diagnostic techniques and what are we trying to detect? So this is what we are going to cover. So what is the need for fungal infections? So increasing incidence of fungal infections is what we have seen, devastating opportunistic infections, microscopy and culture. These are our reference standards, but Many a times it is very difficult, particularly when we have understood, as of yesterday's lecture, we have understood that invasive fungal infections with aspergillosis, it is very difficult to differentiate between colonization and invasive disease. So there are a lot of recommendations for performing the uh, serial diagnostic methods so that our correlation is well. And we know that in this particular case, it could be more towards the, uh, the invasive disease rather than a purely colonization. So the burden of uh, devastating opportunistic infections we have witnessed in our pandemic and the non-culture based techniques have been recommended. Our recommendations also yesterday we have seen a lot of recommendations in the molds as well as in the yeast. We have seen recommendation for the um, performance of zero diagnostic methods. So what are the biomarkers for serodiagnosis of fungal infections? Are they pure antigens? Are they antibodies? Or are we targeting any polysaccharides, which, we are, which are cell wall components? So if you look at the fungus, there are a lot of cell wall components which are being shed during the process of the uh, multiplication of the hyphal forms. And they are present in the structure of the cell. It could be also in the yeast as well as in the molds. In the yeast, the amount of the component is considered to be slightly less compared to the uh, molds. So there is a lot of secretion of the fungal uh, proteins and polysaccharides into the body fluids. And these are very good targets for detection. So it could be detection of antigen or the antibody towards these uh, fungal proteins or the polysaccharides. So these are very, very important and effective method of diagnosing the active infection. Now, antibody detection is useful specifically for the endemic mycosis, uh, which are predominantly caused by the dimorphic fungi. And these endemic mycosis have been uh, understood that they are the systemic mycosis. So predominantly, they have systemic manifestations. So antibody detection is very good for these uh, fungal infections. But there are a lot of limitations and confounding factors in zero diagnosis because the Sensitivity and specificity varies a lot with the host factors, with the uh, microorganism or the fungus and the laboratory techniques. How are we performing the techniques? So this figure actually it uh, explains that there, there are several confounding factors and these could be underlying diseases, concomitant treatment. If you're giving any antibiotics or any other dialysis or any other technique is happening, nutritional modulation, then microbiota, if there are any hostile environment, the patient is hypoxic, or if there is any existing biofilms, medical interventions, antifungal drugs, food uptake, if it is a food composed of more of glucan, then species like antigen producers, and there could be a lot of uh, fungal species or non-fungal also, which can be actually giving us cross-reactivity. Sampling technique, that also is one of the very big confounder in uh, zero diagnostic methods. We have to be very, very careful whenever we are drawing the blood samples for our uh, zero diagnostic methods, specifically for the fungal uh, diseases. So these are very, very sensitive tests and samples have to be taken very carefully. Sample pretreatment is again a very important step in most of the uh, serological tests which are uh, used for fungal and in, in case of fungal diseases. And this again has to be performed as per the protocol of the kit and there cannot be much of deviation. And cut, cutoffs are again, they are defined, but yes, because these cutoffs have been defined based on the, uh, they have been defined where the test was validated. So it cannot be uh, uniformly interpreted in all the populations across the globe. 
So that we will try to understand as we'll progress why there is a need to understand the cutoffs better. Then regarding the antigen clearance. So there can be a point when there is antigen clearance, which cannot be detected well. And antigen antibody complexes are also another very important confounding factor. So these are a lot of confounding factors are there when you are interpreting serodiagnosis. So serodiagnosis performing. So there are a lot of factors which influence during the process of performance, sample collection, performance of the test, and then sitting and interpreting. Because interpretation is something that cannot be solely given as positive and negative by just looking at the report or looking at the uh, OD values or looking at the titers. They have to be interpreted at the back, uh, with the background of the clinical history, the microscopy, the culture results or culture findings, histopathological findings. So these are very, very important to understand and to report the serodiagnostic tests. So if you look at fungal serodiagnosis, we can detect the fungal antibodies and we can detect the antigens. So fungal antibodies have been predominantly uh, important for endemic mycosis as we have uh, understood that. So histoplasmosis, coccidiomycosis, blasto, paracoxidomycosis, and sporotrichosis. So in these conditions, there has been a significant role of the fungal antibodies. Now there can be different techniques through which the fungal antibody detection can be performed like immunodiffusion, complement fixation, lateral flow assay, ELISA. So there are a lot of methods. Then in case of aspergillosis, there has been a lot of progress and there have been a lot of updates also coming up for the antibody detection in aspergillosis. Now this antibody detection aspergillosis, it is having significant role in the chronic pulmonary aspergillosis and to an extent uh, it has almost uh, becoming, it is becoming a point of care test because uh, I will tell you during the course of my presentation that immunocap aspergillus antibody IgG detection, it requires a big instrument and there is a lot, lot of resources that are consumed and uh, there is a lot of money that has to be put. So, but there are other alternatives which are better and just that it needs to be validated in our country. Uh, because there are some centers which are in the process of validating this LD bio kit, which is a ICT based technique. So these are some of the antibody based techniques which we'll be discussing uh, nicely and in detail as we progress with the uh, presentation. So the available technologies for endemic mycosis is uh, predominantly immunodiffusion, complement fixation and enzyme immunoassay. Now coming to the histoplasmosis antibody detection. Complement fixation and immunodiffusion, these are the most common serologic tests in case of histoplasmosis. But if you look at it, the complement fixation and immunodiffusion both detect different antibodies. In the immunodiffusion, it qualitatively measures the precipitating antibodies, which have been called or labeled as H and M precipitating lines or the bands. Whereas the complement fixation, it measures antibodies to either the intact yeast form or mycelial form. So, and these actually are again called as HMIN antigens and is more sensitive than the immunodeficient test, but it is less specific. So sensitivity wise complement fixation is better and to an extent it is quantitative compared to the immunodeficient, which is qualitative. So serological testing for histoplasmosis is most useful if an increase in complement fixation titer is observed between acute and convalescent sera in acute histoplasmosis. High titer may be observed with chronic pulmonary or disseminated histoplasmosis. Complement fixation uh, test titers more than 1 is to 32 may be significant. And low, lower titers, they represent either early infection, cross-reaction or residual antibody. And immunodeficient is less sensitive, but useful in identifying the cross reactions. So as we have, uh, we are seeing that these two tests, they detect different antibodies. So in histoplasmosis, antibodies are positive in severe symptoms. 100% of the patients, you will get positive results in severe patients if the patient is having severity. 70 to 86% of the histoplasmosis patients with mild to moderate symptoms, they will be positive. Uh, antibody detection and 18% in asymptomatic patients, 40% in AIDS versus 82% in patients with or without immunosuppression. And immunodiffusion for histoplasmosis, it has got two bands, uh, H band and the M band. H band, uh, 
the sensitivity is 25% in 25% patients you will get h band and predominantly what you get is uh, m band which is 75% uh, sensitivity in 75% of patients there will be m band so anti h and anti m antibodies can be detected using histoplasmin so anti h and anti m antibodies they are they can be detected using the histoplasmin and this histoplasmin is antigenic extract obtained from histoplasma capsulatum mycelial culture so how is this extractor cells are removed by centrifugation at 1050 g for 10 minutes and the supernatant is filtered through a 0.45 uh, that is a membrane for filtration and uh, removing the contamination and concentrated and dialyzed against phosphate buffered saline the main components of this histoplasmin what we are calling hmi and histoplasmin to which antibody responses occur are the c band m band and the h antigens or the c antigen m antigen and the h antigen out of this the c antigen is considered to be the carbohydrate or the galactomannan and is responsible for cross reactions with other fungal species because we know histoplasmosis again presents or uh, it predominantly has uh, manifestations like aspergillosis and again we find that in case of invasive aspergillosis there is uh, galactomannan positivity is recorded and that is uh, how we define invasive aspergillosis also in the backdrop of um, positive galactomannan assay so the m antigen is uh, catalase and the h antigen is beta glucosidase sensitivity of complement fixation test is 95% better than antigen detection so for histoplasmosis we have got the antibody as well as antigen detection both so if you look at sensitivity the sensitivity of complement fixation test is 95% better and latex agglutination test for detection of igg and igm antibodies which is uh, by the imi companies uh, that has been supplying is the imi diagnostic so that has been used it, it is detecting igg and igm antibodies and radio immunoassay was used earlier which was more sensitive than the immunodiffusion and complement fixation test but yes it had its own complications and hence was now in a, not much encouraged or it became a uh, little bit redundant then elisa uh, we have got around 84% specificity and there are different uh, diagnostics which are available like histoplasma uh, dx select and focus it, it is from focus diagnostics sensitivity is 86% specificity around 84% then the western blot techniques are also available but most of these methods like western blot and elisa to an extent they are difficult to standardize quantitate and interpret coxeridomycosis in, in those regions where coxeridomycosis is endemic complement fixation immunodeficiency tests are available and either tube pre precipitin antibodies that is igm or complement fixing antibodies igg are detected the complement fixation or the immunodeficient test they are performed predominantly in the reference laboratories and can detect up to 90% of the cases the complement fixation titers here also more than 1 is to 32 may be significant and that is around uh, and screening before transplantation in endemic regions for coxeridomycosis is what is taken up with uh, by performing complement fixation test. So FDA has cleared enzyme immunoassay for coxeridomycosis, but again this is less specific. Para coxeridomycosis uh, immunodeficiency is used for screening and diagnostic purpose. Sensitivity is ninety percent and specificity is hundred percent, and number of bands that correlate to the severity of disease. Complement fixation test, there is 100% sensitivity. Cross reaction with histoplasmosis and tuberculosis is seen. So, if you look at specificity, it is slightly uh, less. So, histopathology uh, positive in almost 100% of the cases. And serology, ELISA is uh, correlation is 89%. Immunodiffusion is around 80%. So, those cases where uh, you the detection with um, histopathology was done and it was 100%. Uh, positive in those cases the serology so histopathology always supersedes to serology in case of the paracoxidomycosis and lastly what is uh, falling in line for paracoxidomycosis is the molecular test blastomycosis complement fixation test immunodiffusion they are not much helpful although they are available by the ini and enzyme immunoassay using a antigen uh, the sensitivity lies between 83 to 100% 33 to 50 per percent of cross reaction are seen with histoplasmosis and 
radio immunoassay using wi1 antigen um, it has been uh, done only in some reference setting and not had been adapted it was not much adapted for the clinical testing so anti w I one antibody, its titers fall as the infection resolves. So this was very good uh, for uh, if it can be. It was thought of as a good thing for the uh, prognostic uh, significance, or it was good for prognosis of the case. Then uh, radioimmunase with BAD one, bad one, uh, sensitivity around eighty five percent and specificity around ninety seven percent. Now, sporotrichosis, uh, we also have cases in India with sporotrichosis. So, the latex agglutination test for detection of antibodies or sporotic shenki are available and helpful for extracutaneous infections. Penicillinosis marnifi. So, this is Staldromyces marnifi. And over the period of the lecture, we have understood that this has long been changed to Staldromyces. So, Penicillosis has been changed to Talromyces. So, Talromyces Marnafi recently 61 kilodalton and 54 kilodalton antigens of P. Marnafi purified. At that time, it was P. Marnafi. So, it's still some kits, they do write P. Marnafi purified and specifically recognized 86% and 17% of patients. They have been specific, specificity has been recognized. So, it is quite variable, but in case of talromyces and predominantly histopathology and molecular tests are very significant for the even for some of the endemic diseases antibody detection in candidiasis uh, the candidate antigens include the cell wall manan mixed cytoplasmic antigen and sap that is secretory aspartyl proteinase the most promising promising antigens purified were the enolase and hsp and uh, Latex agglutination, immunodiffusion, immunoelectrophoresis, radioimmunase, and enzyme immunase were the techniques that were suggested or are still being continuing. They are under process for candidiasis. So, immunodiffusion sensitivity is 29% and specificity 67%. Immunoblotting, which is using 47 kilodalton uh, antigen, so it has got 74% sensitivity and prognostic value. And ELISA for detection of antibodies against the SAP, the sensitivity is somewhere around 70% and specificity is 76%. So there is one Platelia Candida antibody test which is available by BioRad Laboratories and this is based on ELISA using Manon antigen and sensitivity is 53% but specificity is 94%. But in case of uh, Canada, the antibody detection, in, it is difficult to distinguish between the active and the uh, past infection, and also between colonization and the fungemia. Coming to antibody detection in aspergillosis. So there has been a lot of progress in case of antibody detection in aspergillosis. Extrinsic asthma is the condition where IgE is preferred. Extrinsic Allergic asthma is the condition where there is more of increase in the because it has been long standing, so there is more of IgG. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, both IgG and IgE for specific aspergillus antigen, they are important. But if we look at most of the uh, techniques that were available, they usually tend to detect the IgE. Aspergilloma, both specific IgG and IgE are important and immunodiffusion, counter immunoelectrophoresis and uh, the ELISA are frequently used. Sensitivity of immunodiffusion for aspergillosis is somewhere between 70 to 100% in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. The positivity rates actually increase in extrinsic allergic alveolitis. And 98 to 99% of aspergilloma patients, uh, often there is uh, three or more bands that are seen in immunodiffusion and sensitivity of 0 to 70% in invasive aspergillosis. Immunoblotting and analytic isoelectrical focusing are highly sensitive tests. ELISA for detection of IgG, IgM are available. So if we just focus on the most available uh, tests, that is uh, many centers have got FADIA. So FADIA is the equipment where actually there is a lot of allergen testing that can be performed and antibody detection against uh, these uh, allergen tests. So it is one of the uh, technique where ELISA can be performed in an automated way with lot of uh, with all the reagents in place. So this is based on the uh, if you just look at it, uh, it is based on the principles of ELISA and this immunocap 
it is specific for the IGE. Now, because the machines have been uh, provided in India, which have now become uh, like uh, old models and there is no supply of resources or reagents. So many centers are unable to do this immunocap specific for IgE, even for IgG, if we want to detect it, it is only for research purposes. So because these equipments are very costly and um, reagents are also costly. So it has been a lot of struggle to perform this test in a routine basis. So if you look total IgE of more than 1000 international units per ml is what is very significant and in case of aspergillus fumigatus usually it is more than 0.35 KUA per liter. So if you just uh, look at the principle there is a solid phase and these are the allergens. So uh, based on the, the allergens are coated on the solid phase and we are trying to detect the IgE antibody in uh, the uh, patients who are asthmatic or they are having alveolitis. So then there are specific antibody to these Ig antibodies, uh, which are coated with some uh, enzymes and they, then you have conjugate and there will be some uh, reaction that will occur. So this is purely based on, and you have got the machine supplies with all the reagents. So it, it, is, it happens in an automated way where you can detect. But this was costly and to a uh, lot of uh, effort was required and resources were spent. So antibody based tests for chronic pulmonary aspergillosis and ABPA has the area of work and a lot of research has happened over the years. So precipitants detected by immunodeficient are counter immunoelectrophoresis to detect uh, the chronic pulmonary aspergillosis and multiple types of immunoglobulin were targeted IgM, IgG. So these techniques have now replaced by enzyme immune assay and western blot and uh, immunodeficient assay IMI, it was only for specific, uh, uh, mostly it was for these common species or specifically like Aspergillus fumigatus, Clavus, Niger or Tereus. But it was time consuming and every time there was a standardization that was uh, required and there was less of reproducibility. Uh, there was challenges with uh, performance sensitivity less than 60% and precipitant test positive only in cases, only few cases of aspergillus, flavors, and niger. So aspergillus specific IgG enzyme immunoassay, that is anti-galactomannan assays commercially were available. Uh, in that immunocap, we have got immunolite, virion or serion, dynamiker, biorad, imi, and others. So they give diagnostic cutoffs, so which can be followed and some are helpful to monitor the treatment response. But again, the uh, sensitivity and specificity, it varies. And it is improved uh, sensitivity and specificity if we are using the recombinant antigens. And there is lack of decline that what has been observed uh, if there is suspicious of the treatment failure. So actually, you don't get very good fall. So you can suspect in those cases that um, there, there is a treatment failure. So it is helpful for monitoring the cases. So Sirion is something that is very, very helpful in uh, prognosis of the patient or to if you are not finding that the titers are falling and it is not declining. So the cause could be, uh, it, it gives you a clue of treatment failure. And, but again, there is a trick in this, uh, the decline is slow. So to interpret this decline, uh, it may take weeks and you have to repeat the test. So that is again, very important thing here. And there is more clinical validation is needed for better definition of the treatment failure. So although we say Sirion is good for the monitoring the treatment response, but still, uh, if we look at it, um, the problem is that it takes weeks to decline and henceforth, uh, the follow-up is slightly tricky in this case. So enzyme immunoassay is most reliable method for diagnosing the chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. But again, there may be major interassay variations. And cutoffs for aspergillus enzyme immunoassay are crucial. But we cannot uh, deny for the cross-reactivity. They do occur. Cross-reactivity is seen between the species. Now, aspergillus western blot IgG, it was by LD Biodiagnostics. And immunoblotting was there. So it was used to diagnose various forms of aspergillosis and sensitivity 88% and 94% specificity, but less clinical data are available for this. Now this uh, LD bio Western blot has been further uh, upgraded or further it has been uh, done or expanded to ICT 
uh, technique, which is again uh, like a point of care test, and the results are interpreted very fast. So this LD Biodiagnostics from France has introduced this new point of care lateral flow assay, LD Bioaspergillus ICT for detection of aspergillus antibodies, which are both IgG and IgM. So the recently introduced aspergillus uh, ICT test requires minimal time and resources and equipment, and its use would be highly compatible with settings where chronic pulmonary aspergillosis diagnostics are a critical need. A Stucky Hunter et al. study, it has shown a very good sensitivity of around 91.6% and specificity of 98% for diagnosis of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. And this study was in UK uh, with ICT test significantly outperforming uh, the workhorse because there's a lot of uh, things that are required in case of immunocap test. So most of these studies, even in India, there are a lot of centers uh, who are trying to validate this LD bioassay for uh, the Indian population. So here, again, the limitation is that even if you have to do validation, it has to be done with immunocap uh, assay, which, for which you require some of the machines, and it is the limiting factor again. So globally, in many areas, many countries, the validation has almost been complete, and the sensitivity and specificity has been uh, uh, very high and it has been well recorded. Now, <clears throat> aspergillus specific IgE. Again, there are in enzyme immunoassay or CIE to diagnose ABPA to detect aspergillus sensitization and to detect elevated and total aspergillus fumigator specific Ig titers. So, total IgE more than 1000 international units per ml is what is very significant. And aspergillus specific Ig positive and IgG are also detected, which actually give us a clue of IBPA. So there is improved specificity measuring Ig to aspergillus fumigators and flavors. And limitations are cross-reactivity among the fungi. And some degree of standardization is again required. So usually they are good. And the antibody titers, they actually vary with the species. So 30 to 50 percent of patients with AVPA have got detectable aspergillus fumigators antibodies. Now, coming to detection of fungal antigens, cryptococcus, the lateral flow assay, and ELISA, they're excellent for a fungal antigen detection. Histoplasmosis, again, we have radioimmunosis or ELISA. These are very good for histoplasma antigen detection. Canidiasis antigens that are mannan, enolase, secretory aspartyl proteinase, these are promising, but there are variable results. Now, there is uncharacterized Cantec, Cantec MT, sensitivity is around 33 to 71%. And galactomannan is again in lateral flow assay or ELISA, it is again promising. So if we start with cryptococcus, cryptococcal antigen uh, detection is based on three serology techniques, three cryptococcus serology techniques. We will start with lateral flow assay. And slowly as we'll progress is very important. Here I want to mention that these three techniques have to be well understood why uh, one is better than the other or why other is um, uh, um, it has been discontinued or is not preferred much. So lateral flow assay actually requires no pretreatment of the sample. It has high sensitivity for cryptococcal antigen of all serotypes, and it is suitable for use in settings with no minimal or advanced infrastructure, rapid results you get within 10 minutes, and low overall cost, and storage of kits is roughly around 2 to 25 degrees. It is based on the sandwich immunochromatographic assay, and it uses monoclonal antibodies. Now, cryptococcal lateral flow assay, there is only uh, one which is FD approved. So FD approved cryptococcal antigen lateral flow assay is IMI and its sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value are good. So it is useful for serum, plasma, CSF or urine when compared to culture. So this is actually uh, we can use for serum, plasma, CSF and urine. All can be tested. But if you look at the uh, sensitivity, uh, specificity, they are quite variable with the samples again. So they have a lot of variations with the samples, which will be, uh, if you read the literature, uh, it will be seen that there's variation with the samples. And always the results are uh, better uh, with the uh, urine or else uh, with the CSF. So there is very slight difference if you look at it between the serum and plasma. So overall, the sensitivity specificity is almost same, but different uh, lateral flow assay kits give uh, different samples which can be performed. Like with the IMI, uh, you have got a serum, plasma, CSF or urine, all can be performed. But there are other uh, lateral flow assay kits 
which are available for serum plasma or csf only there is no um, urine sample cannot be processed in those so fd approved is only one that is your ini so if you look at it there is uh, one crypto ps that is biosync crypto ps here the samples that can be used what we are using is biosync and it gives you results in the form of positive strong positive and this is a ICT based uh, technique of lateral flow assay and this is uh, image crypto antigen which gives uh, to an extent a kind of uh, semi quantitative uh, assay and these assays are very important uh, for the antigen detection and the performance is very good imi is fd approved but biosynx is what is preferred it is in the form of a cassette and it is very easy to perform and this actually t1 t2 there is variation in the uh, amount of the antigen that is present so if you have t1 uh, band and t2 is absent so it explains for the result is positive t1 and t2 obviously it will be present in strong positive cases where the amount of antigen is high and t1 is where the amount of antigen is very low so <clears throat> it is in nanograms and whereas it is will be in micrograms in case of uh, t2 band but we don't give the report as a, a quantitative or semi quantitative in biosynths we just give the report as positive and uh, positive or negative so if you get only control line it is given as uh, negative so these are some of the uh, lateral flow assay based techniques where you don't require any sample treatment it just it is very easy just on the sample pad you have to add the sample and you get the results so fungus zero diagnosis again based on uh, lateral flow say what we have un understood it as that there are four cryptococcal antigen uh, based lateral flow assay based tests imi biosync cryptops strong step and uh, fungi expert Uh, so uh, strong step a fungi expert and one essay that is dynamiker so this is another essay of lateral flow essay out of these were the three imi biosync cryptops and strong step a uh, where the validation has all uh, has been done but with dynamiker it is currently under validation and sensitivities vary between 96 and 99% with corresponding sensitivities uh, between 90 and 99% in serum and sensitivities of 98 to 100% and specificities of 98 to 100% in csf specificity in blood is more variable uh, that is it lies between 90 to 99% so high hook dose effect is seen high hook dose effect is equivalent to what we have understood as prozone phenomenon so in this case again you have to dilute the serum so you get for to get your good results now coming to the second technique of zero diagnosis based on antigen detection cryptococcus is latex agglutination test here the uh, while we will try to understand why we, this was uh, this was performed but it was again uh, it needed a technical uh, ex uh, technical expertise because and because uh, there were some steps which needed to be performed extra like serum samples had to be pre treated with prones and reduce sensitivity for cryptococcal antigen of zero type c and it was not suitable for use in settings with no or minimal infrastructure and rapid results at 10 to 30 minutes depending on specimen type was obtained this was a, a good thing but pre treatment was uh, required very much and immediate overall cost was also what people had observed and polyclonal antibodies these are not monoclonal these are polyclonal antibodies are used to detect polysaccharide antigen easy and highly sensitive and specific for meningeal and disseminated disease high sensitivity and specificity more than 90% but latex agglutination has got cross reactivity for trichosporin bigelli capnocytophaga canimorsus and stomatococcus mucilaginous uh, malignancy again bacterial septicemia and if there are any technical issues that is also a problem and we can have some cross reactivity occurring because of the hydroxyethyl starch soaps disinfectants Uh, so technically if uh, those things are not well maintained so that again causes a cross reactivity and insufficient treatment for proteins contained in the samples so this have been reported as the causes of cross reactivity so the, technically there are were lot of steps in latex agglutination test and it had to be performed with lot of care so uh, the serum sensitivity ranged from 83 to 97% and the tests with lower sensitivity did not use prones so that was what has been observed that those tests where prones was not used on serum specimens the sensitivity was uh, low and the like cryptococcal antigen latex specificity on serum it ranged from 93 to 100% 
The CSF sensitivity of cryptococcal antigen latex tests ranged between 93 to 100% and specificity ranging from 93 to 98%. Now, commercially, the uh, latex agglutination kits that have been available over years has been CryptoLA, which was international biologicals. The polyclonal antibody was used here. Microimmune, uh, again, polyclonal antibody was used. Immune latex crypto uh, test that was uh, from the Immunomycologics USA, polyclonal antibody again. Kalas was using, this is a very good uh, test, Kalas Meridian Diagnostics, Ohio. So this Kalas actually it uses monoclonal antibody. Uh, but with the colors is that it is slightly costlier and I can and test is also available. Uh, then Pasture XTM Crypto Plus, uh, this is also commercially available. Again, it uses monoclonal antibodies. Murex Cryptococcus IgM based also uses monoclonal antibodies. Now coming to the third uh, type of cryptococcal antigen detection assay, that is enzyme immune assay. It again requires no pretreatment of samples, and but there is reduced sensitivity for cryptococcal antigen of serotype C and D. And it is not suitable for in, in use in settings with no or minimal infrastructure. And longer time to result is there 35 to 45 minutes, high overall cost. So if you look at the enzyme immune assay, sensitivity and specificity are good. It ranges for 94 to 96% in serum and for CSF 100 to 98 percent. So there is mono polyclonal capture and there is monoclonal detection. So there are two things that is occurring. There is a polyclonal capture and there is monoclonal detection. And biotin amplified, it is sandwich ELISA is the technique. And detection limits for A to D serotypes are uh, different. And 0.63 uh, for, uh, for it is variable among the serotypes. And non-capsular culture filtrate. So this is again very, very important. Non-capsular, uh, uh, non-capsular culture filtrate antigens, uh, 34 to 38 kiloralton and 115 kiloralton can be detected by the monoclonal antibodies. It is useful in diagnosing cryptococcus due to non-capsular strains in AIDS patients. So the companies that were uh, providing this enzyme in assay were Premier Crypto Antigen Assay Meridian Diagnostics. So this is the only advantage of cryptococcus enzyme immune assay we see that it can be helpful for detecting non-capsular stains in AIDS patients. So uh, if we just want to summarize about the enzyme immune assay for cryptococcus, so what we have understood is the point of care test is the either uh, the IMI based uh, technique or lateral flow assay or the uh, which is validated FDA approved or the biosyncs which we are using which is again uh, just you put the sample and you get the results within 10 minutes you can use biosyncs with the serum uh, CSF um, these are serum CSF whole blood uh, plasma these are the samples which can be used for the uh, biosyncs. Now coming to the fungal serodiagnosis based on specific pan fungal cell markers, cell wall markers like 13 beta d glucane assay. Now there is FDA approved fungal cell wall component that is 13 beta d glucane assay and it offers a non-invasive method for the potential surveillance and diagnosis of invasive fungal infections. 13 beta glucane testing it requires a minimally invasive sample and uh, can be used like we are using uh, it can be performed on blood and serum it has been validated for the serum samples. So uh, it, it has not been validated for bile or other samples and can be used in a used to aid in diagnosis of non in, in invasive fungal infections and also to monitor response to treatment. One of the disadvantages of 13 beta d glucan testing is that a positive test alone it lacks sufficient sensitivity and specificity for a definitive diagnosis. Now this is based on the principle of uh, limulus amebocyte lysate. So what it was seen that uh, around in the year of uh, 1977, FDA it approved the use of limulus amebocyte lysate as an alternative pyrogen test when evaluating the approval of intravenous pharmaceuticals or biochemical solutions. And um, in 1968, a carboxy methylated beta-glucan was being evaluated as an anti-tumor agent. And it was observed to induce clotting with the limulus amoebocyte lysate, despite the absence of demonstrable bacterial contamination. So here, he, what we understand is endotoxin is due to bacterial contamination. So there, what happened? Uh, if you have bacterial contamination, there is factor C, which is activated. And the factor C is serine protease zymogen. So this is activated and it is it, uh, serine uh, protease uh, zymogen is activated. Factor C is formed, which again causes clotting. This is actually, it activates the clotting mechanism. So if this step is inhibited, 
so without any bacterial contamination so this was not there if there is no bacterial contamination then what was there the glucan component what did it give it gave activated factor g so what was this factor g it was a second serine protease dimogen so this serine protease dimogen another serine protease dimogen this was called as factor g and they were seeing they have understood that it causes the <clears throat> clotting mechanism so they have introduced an artificial substrate which actually gives color once there is a clotting mechanism it starts so that is the whole principle of the uh, uh, of the 1 3 beta glucan assay so in case of 1 3 beta glucan assay there is one step we are where you are trying to inactivate this particular cycle where you are you want to uh, remove the factor c and you are uh, taking care of this uh, factor g in case of the 1 3 beta glucan assay so the most of the uh, soluble uh, beta glucan assay that typically exists are triple helix forms and it requires to be converted to single strand forms by exposing the serum samples to alkaline a reagents so you will see that in this beta glucan assay there are alkaline pre treatment has to be done so that is one of the very important steps that has been described and <clears throat> the clotting enzyme uh, that we see has been uh, cleaved uh, or it has there is an artificial substrate which has been placed which the clotting enzyme cleaves and that artificial substrate that has been used is the para nitroanilate and this actually forms a synthetic compound peptide in the beta glucan limulus amebocyte lysate and this actually is replacing the original clot forming uh, collagen protein so this chromogen para nitroanilate it is colorless when attached to the peptide but it changes to yellow color when it is cleaved from the synthetic peptide and that is how you are trying to record it's a purely calorimetric assay so 1 3 beta glucan assay is a purely calorimetric assay and glucan it is very important and it is for the in the fungus because it is predominantly seen in secreted in, in case of fungal infections a polysaccharide which is a component of the cell wall so while the cell wall of the yeast has been suggested to contain less glucan than filamentous molds glucan are a major constituent of the cell wall of saprophytic and pathogenic fungi with some of the exceptions like mucorrhizopus and blastomyces dermatitis and cryptococcus species currently there are five beta d glucan assays available for use fungitel uh, which we are using here endosafe pts fungitec g beta glucan test bg star uh, beta glucan test now the endosafe pts and the beta glucan uh, test kits uh, that is um, back of your chemical industries of japan they are intended only for research purposes and not for diagnosis of invasive fungal infections and clinical samples so these uh, these two are actually if we look at it the endosafe and the uh, backo company of the in japan is for research use only so there there are different sources of this limulus amebocyte lysate which is a cal calorimetric assay so fungitel uses uh, it is fda approved out of all if you look at it endosafe fungitec g M mk beta glucan test of backo and bg star they are, none of them are fda approved only fungitel is fda approved and fda has reclassified uh, gluca uh, tel test uh, which was class 2 medical device in 2004 to fungitel and this is the only available commercially uh, fda approved commercially used for invasive fungal infections now coming to galactomannan assay for aspergillus <clears throat> this is again a, a fungal cell wall marker that we are detecting galactomannan is part of the outer layer of aspergillus cell wall it is released during growth of fungus at the tips of the hyphae and galactomannan is present at the free or in association with immune complex in serum bile and urine and uh, important tool in diagnosis of aspergillosis uh, eortc based on eortc msg uh, definitions there have been recent definitions in 2021 including the covid guidelines so we can refer to that and they may be positive before the occurrence of clinical and radiological signs and symptoms so this is based on the principle of uh, sandwich elisa so platelia is the company which we are using from biorad for detection and detection limit is of about 1 nanogram per ml and it is again fda approved platelia kit and there is a rat monoclonal antibody and galactomannan is present in the patient serum or bile both the samples have been validated by the platelia for detection of galactomannan assay then rat monoclonal antibody include with attached with peroxidase is what is the detection antibody and a chromogen is attached to it so it is based on the principle of elisa 
Now, there are two main strategies that are important in most of the labs because they cannot be performed regularly. These tests, you have to prepare a strategy if you are going to start, on which day you will do the beta D glucan test, on which day you are going to do galactomannan. And if it is uh, like uh, for um, symptomatic patients or for the high risk patients, so for high risk patients, serial collection of samples is required two or three times per week. And intensive testing in symptomatic patients has to be done where unexplained persistent fever or unresponsive to broad spectrum antibiotics has been observed. So there has been some screening strategy that has been given and diagnostic driven strategy. For screening strategy, usually blood is preferred. Galactomannan or equivalent uh, beta D glucan test, mannan, anti mannan, other assays can also be. Uh, combinedly performed and uh, twice weekly sampling has to be done and interpretation of results uh, it depends on the patient population screen and it uh, if it is negative or positive if it is positive then you switch over to the uh, diagnostic driven strategy here you are concentrating again on the bal tracheal um, uh, sample and the uh, non invasive bal and the uh, so nbl is very important sample here so NBL galactomannan is also performed. So these again, you have to add up in the list and interdisciplinary approach like radio diagnosis is important. Then bronchoscopy, fundoscopy, ECG, imaging, all these come into play along with culture and other tests. So it is again a correlated test. So there are a lot of guidelines on how to interpret the screening strategy and diagnostic driven strategy for the galactomannan assay. Now, uh, test should be used as a screening tool for the early detection of invasive aspergillosis. In neutropenic patients with hematological malignancies and or HSCT recipients, it is used for screening. A single or consecutive positive assays with raised OD index can serve as microbiological criterion for probable invasive aspergillosis. And serum galactomannan test uh, cleared as an aid to diagnose invasive aspergillosis in cancer patients. Bowel fluid, it has demonstrated excellent sensitivity in hematology and non-hematology patients, as we have understood yesterday also in non-neutropenic patients, bowel sample is very important to interpret raised galactomannan or the early galactomannan uh, uh, positivity is seen with the bowel sample and it is used as a confirmatory assay in patients with unexplained radiological features and it is not for the early detection of invasive aspergillosis. Uh, bowel galactomannan assays yet uh, can be recommended to assess the outcome of fungal therapies. This is uh, actually, it is not well placed and it is still under the process of recommendation. And in case of invasive aspergillosis, because why it is not for early detection of invasive aspergillosis? Because uh, we never know that bal um, uh, galactomannan assay or bal positive galactomannan positivity will always end up with the invasive aspergillosis because it is seen in cases of non neutropenic um, aspergillosis patients or uh, non neutropenic uh, risk factor patients. So in those cases where there is no neutropenia, the invasive aspergillosis occurs after days or after it takes a long time. So the presentation is if you are uh, screening in those group of high risk patients, it cannot be. Uh, it is not detecting your invasive aspergillosis actually. Uh, it tells you about the risk of aspergillosis in those patients. Now, uh, false positivity can be seen with transient antigenemia, cross reactivity with galactomannan of penicillium, pestilomyces, alternaria, cladosporium, cross reaction with sera of histoplasmosis, cryptococcus, penicillosis, and that is talromyces, manophy, and geotrichum infection, and induction by cyclophosphamide, premature infants, cotton swabs, glucan, uh, galactomannan, and glucan. In both the cases, we have to be very, very careful with our cotton swabs. We cannot use anywhere. And absorption of galactomannan through a damaged intestinal mucosa, caspofungin therapy, and also with some of the antibiotics. Exposure to mold active antifungal agents and sensitivity is roughly around 52% versus 89%. If patient has been receiving antifungal agents, the sensitivity is lower. And uh, there is some, uh, if it is below detection level, then also it is a problem. And 750 uh, microliter filtered with 50 kilodalton micron filter increases the sensitivity uh, with the aspergillus fumigators and flavors, which have shown to be having low reactivity. Whereas the Aspergillus, TDS, Niger, and Nidulins, they have high concentration of galactomannan, and with them, the results are good if you're performing galactomannan. So if, the, if there is the infection suspected is because of these agents, so the results will be good. Now, BAL and serum have both been validated and uh, evaluated for suspected primary invasive aspergillosis, and positive result uh, can be validated by repeating the test before starting empiric therapy. A search for other evidences is important. Again, histopathology and imaging uh, have to be done and evaluate the causes for inaccurate results of galactomannan, like galactomannan contamination, cross-reactive mycosis, or more active antifungal therapy. 
histoplasmosis antigen detection histoplasma polysaccharide antigen detection again it provides a rapid diagnosis radiomin assay using rapid polyclonal antibodies used to detect in urine serum csf and bulk we have to monitor therapy and to diagnose relapse so these are the two conditions where histoplasma antigen detection is very very helpful you can even monitor the therapy as well as relapse sensitivity is more in urine roughly around 92% than in serum where it is 83% and cross reaction has been demonstrated with blastomycosis paracoxidomycosis penicillosis recently inhibition elisa has been developed using monoclonal antibody and elisa imi is something that is uh, diagnostic and it is the preferred one for histoplasmosis antigen detection candidiasis there are some in pipeline like the manan uh, it has been found as immuno complexes and a small amount of cell wall carbohydrate homopolymer is in circulation so dissociation is necessary but protein digestion ex exposure to extremes of ph or boiling these are uh, important steps then it has got a short half life and detection by counter immune electrophoresis eia ria and rpla can be done elisa using polyclonal antibodies have been available sandwich elisa by platelia canada antigen we, we have discussed it has got good sensitivity and specificity but should be repeated frequently <clears throat> la candida antigen detection polyclonal is there pasteurex canada monoclonal antibody detection uh, antigen detection and uh, this actually is uh, have the kit is having the monoclonal antibody and la candida antigen detection kit has got polyclonal antibodies so it will be detecting for it has got polyclonal antibodies and you are detecting antigen for that elisa is more sensitive than rpla and manen of cryptococcal uh, manen of candida albicans cannot detect the candida cruzi or glabrata so this is one of the important things that we have to remember now enolase is abundant cytoplasmic enzyme produced by all candida except the glabrata double sandwich liposomal assay using murine immuno murine iga and monoclonal antibody absorbed through nitrocellular membrane is what is used and um, the sensitivity is around 75% specificity 96% multiple samples have increased the sensitivity and detection of enolase can complement rather than replace the blood culture but uh, this has been withdrawn from the market then under characterized uh, technique is cantec assay latex particle sensitized with antibody against heat kill blastoconidium this antigen does not contain manan and no need for immune complex dissociation which was required in case of manan sensitivity ranging from 33 to 71% and recently modification was described like microdata plate form has been available sensitivity and specificity uh, sensitivity 100% specificity 80% so today we will be demonstrating to you calactomanan assay and the uh, uh, platelia based technique and the fungital assay that is beta d glucan assay for uh, beta d glucan assay the kit that we are using is um, fungital so both the tests will be demonstrated for video and uh, this calactomanan assay of platelia uh, was developed in netherlands and was marketed in europe by Sin by sanofi diagnostics and slowly it was purchased by biorad laboratories so this is the only one approved uh, fd approved uh, platelia tm aspergillus enzyme immune assay so this is a uh, galactoman antigen assay which we can consider it as a uh, cell wall marker detection rather than a purely as antigen so each galactoman molecule has 10 epitopes both capture and detector antibodies specific for epitopes can be attached to the molecule and the platelia aspergillus enzyme immune assay comprises of a rat monoclonal antibody EBA2 that reacts with a specific epitope of galactomannan. It is an IgM antibody uh, based technique with an avidity constant of uh, 2 into 10 to the power 9 to 5 into 10 to the power 9 m and binds to an epitope located on the beta 15 galactofuranase containing side chain of galactomannan molecule. The epitope recognized by the EBA2 monoclonal antibody is a common oli oligosaccharide moiety of a wide range of intracellular and extracellular glycoproteins of Aspergillus species. And therefore, detection of galactomannan can possibly be used as a biomarker for diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis. Now, there are two important phases which will be shown to you in the video, uh, extraction phase and the test phases. Now, coming to the fungital kit which we are using for detection of 1,3-beta-D glucan assay. So, this kit actually, if we look at the fungital kit, it, it is supplied with fungital reagent. It has got beta-glucan standard, reagent-grade water, pyrozol buffer. Uh, then you have alkaline pretreatment, uh, KOH and KCL, pyro, pyroplate, and there are some instructions which have to be read very, very carefully. So preparation of fungital uh, test has to be, with the contamination control has to be done uh, before that. The serology room for fungal, uh, for fungal diagnostics has to be completely separate, fumigation and all these steps 
contamination control has to be thorough glucan is everywhere that is what we have to think so no powder glows no high traffic areas no direct impact of hvac no powders dust starched lab coats no gauze you have to use special wipes and class 2 hood is very important uncluttered working environment is required positive cut off is 80 picogram per ml again if you look at it this is can be interpreted uh, differently with the population sample is 5 microliters of serum and beta d glucan level in the reaction mixture in, in the well is around 5 microliter per 1000 uh, microliter per ml and roughly if you look at it uh, uh, 0.4 picogram is the amount in the reaction mixture so this is excellent technique if it is done uh, with all perfection so these were my references and uh, now we will proceed with the uh, videos which will demonstrate to you each and every technique step wise so let us proceed with the uh, videos thank you Detail is a FDI approved colorimetric quantitative assay for the detection of beta D glucan in the serum of patient with symptoms of invasive fungal infection. Since it is a quantitative assay, the concentration or amount of beta D glucan can be detected by spectrophotometrically and can be measured in picogram per milliliter. Fungital kit contains two vials of reagent grade water, two vials of lyophilized glucan standard. 96 well microplate alkaline pretreatment solution of two vials pyrozole reconstitution buffer two vials fungital reagent lyophilized ensure all the necessary equipments needed ready in the bio safety before the beginning of the test ensure that plate reader is turned on before the acid test at 37 degree centigrade Make sure that all the required accessories should be easily accessible in the bio safety to avoid contamination and proper handling of pipette. Properly remove the aluminum shield of reagent vials by the pipette tip and after the pretreatment cover the vial top carefully with parafilm. Transfer all serum samples in 2 ml pyrogen free micro tubes in the hood. Always wear a nitrile gloves. Do not use reagents beyond their expiry date. Serum sample should be placed outside the hood once it comes down the room temperature then only transfer it to the micro tube carefully Step number 1 is preparation of glucan standard for standard curve preparation by serial dilution method Keep 5 micro tubes serially arranged and labeled it has 100 microliters 50 microliters 25 microliters 12 microliters and 6.25 microliters add 500 microliters of reagent grade water to each four micro tubes dissolve one vial of glucan standard with the volume of reagent grade water stat stated on the vial to 100 microliter of solution vortex each dilution tube to resuspend this solution 
The glucans solution should be stored at minus 2 to minus 8 degree centigrade and should be used within 3 days. From the stock standard glucan, 1 ml of the solution is taken to the first test tube and labeled it as 100 microliters. This first test tube is vortex nicely and from this first test tube we will take 500 microliters of solution and add to the second test tube. The second test tube which is labeled as 500 microliters of the concentration is vortex and from the second test tube 500 microliters of solution is taken and added into the third test tube. Third test tube is labeled as 25 microliters of the concentration. From the third test tube we are taking 500 microliters of the solution and we will add it to the fourth one. In the fourth one we will vortex it nicely and we will take 500 microliters of the solution and add up to the last test tube which is labeled as 6.25 microliters. Again we will vortex it Serial dilution process is completed. Step number second is alkali pretreatment solution of the samples. So open the alkali pretreatment solution. Add alkali pretreatment solution of 20 microliters without changing the tips. Then add 5 microliters of serum sample with it.
after the addition of serum samples pretreated plate is incubated for 10 minutes in the elisa reader third step is the reconstitution of fungitel reagent for this we add 700 microliters of pyrozole reconstitute buffer and 700 microliters of reagent grade waters which is taken four ti four times cover the vial with parafilm using the slide of the parafilm that face the paper backing do not vortex the reconstitute fungitel reagent step number 4 is addition of standards at 25 microliters of glucan standards vertically from lower to high dilution step number 5 is addition of 100 microliters of fungitel reagent to all the serum sample first without touching the surface of the sample and without changing the tip then tip change for adding 100 microliters of fungitel reagent for glucan standards and the negatives insert the plate carefully into the microplate reader at 37 degree centigrade for 40 minutes
after 40 minutes the results are interpreted as if less than 60 picogram per milliliter the result will be considered as negative between 60 to 79 picogram per, mil per milliliter the result is interpreted as indeterminate here the repeat testing is recommended and more than 80 picogram per milliliter the result is considered to be the positive So now we will proceed with the next video that is about the Aspergillus galactomanin assay. The Platelia galactomannan antigen test is a FDI approved serological test based on the principle of immunoenzymatic sandwich ELISA. This test is used to detect the Aspergillus galactomannan antigen in the patient's serum and bile sample. This test is used in the combination with other non-specific diagnostic methods like the conventional microbiological culture, histopathological examination of the deep tissues and the radiological evidences for detecting the invasive aspergillosis. Before starting the test, the Platelia galactomannan kit should be placed outside and allow it to come down at the room temperature. Do not use the reagents beyond their expiry date. The components consist of R1 to R10 labeled reagents. Galactomannan kit is provided with three quality controls, R3 the negative control, R4 the cutoff control and R5 the positive control. All the quality controls must be processed at the same time as the test samples. The first step is the sample pretreatment in which we pipe it out 300 microliters of these test samples along with the controls into the 1.5 ml of polypropylene tube. Then we add 100 microliters of sample pretreatment solution R7 to each tubes. R7 is the sample pretreatment solution which consists of EDTA solution. EDTA is a chelating agent which removes out all the metal ions from the samples as well as it is also an important component which denatures the protein complexes which is present in the sample. We will add 100 microliters of sample pretreatment solution to the controls as well as the, the test samples of bal and serum. After the addition of R7 sample pretreatment solution, we will vortex each sample tubes along with the quality control tubes. Make sure that all the tubes are tightly closed to prevent opening during the heating step. After vortexing, 
heat the tubes for 3 minutes at 100 degree centigrade in the water bath. Always remember tube must be placed in the water bath only when the prescribed temperature is reached. After heating step carefully removes all the tubes from the boiling water bath and place it in a centrifuge. Centrifuge the tubes at 10,000 rpm for 10 minutes. The supernatant is removed and separated and this is used for the detection of galactomannan antigen. After preparation, the supernatant may be removed and stored at 2 to minus 8 degree centigrade for up to 48 hours prior to testing. If analysis of the results indicate the retesting is required, the repeat sample must be treated for testing. After centrifugation, we will add R6 which is our conjugate, act as a primary antibody and we will add about 50 microliters of conjugate to each well of microtitle plate. Next step is to add 50 microliters of supernatant, the clear fluid, in each well of the microtiter plate. First, we will add the supernatant of the samples, then we will add the supernatant of the quality controls. Always remember, do not add the sample fluids to the wells before the conjugate. Do not add the serum or bile fluid samples to the well before the conjugate. Cover the plate with the plate sealer to prevent the evaporation and ensuring that the entire surface is covered and watertight. Then incubate the micro plate in the incubator for 90 minutes at 37 degrees centigrade. After 90 minutes remove the micro titer plate, remove the plate sealer and aspirate the contents of all wells into the waste container. Next step is the washing step in which we wash the plate for 5 times with a micro plate washer or we can do it manually.
After the last wash, invert the microplate and gently tap on the absorbent paper to remove the remaining liquid. After the washing step, rapidly add 200 microliters of chromogen TMB solution which act as a substrate to each well and avoid exposure to the bright light. Then incubate the microplate in the dark at the room temperature of 25 degree centigrade for 30 minutes and do not use the adhesive film during the incubation step. Next step is to add 100 microliters of stopping solution to each well. Read the optical density of each well at 450 nanometer and microplate must be read within 30 minutes of adding or stopping solution. In this demonstration, we will be going to discuss about the calculation of the quality control and how to interpret the results of the test samples which is performed. As the quality control is very much necessary and plays a key role in the validation of any experiment, the Platelia Galactomannan kit is also provided with the quality control with their validation criteria. These quality controls are as follow. First one is the cutoff control which is labeled as R4 and its composition have human serum with aspergillus galactomannan antigen in it. The OD value range for each well containing the R4 must have the range of 0.3 and greater than 0.3 to less than 0.8. Second is interpretation of mean cutoff control. For the interpretation of mean cutoff control, we need to add the OD of the two wells containing the R4 that is the cutoff control and divide the total by 2. For example, in our test run we got two cutoff control values. First one is the 0.488 and second is 0.417. So we will divide the values of the OD by we will add the values of the OD and divide it by 2. So we will get the range of 0.696 which is a valid criteria. Third one is the interpretation for the positive control. The index value for the positive control must be greater than 1.50. So the formula is index value is equals to OD value for positive control upon the mean cutoff value. For example, in our test run we got the OD value for positive control has 1.320 which is divided by our mean cutoff control. So we, we will get the value of 1.89 which is in the range of our valid criteria. Third, fourth one is our interpretation of negative control. So the index for the value of negative control must be in the range of less than 0 0.40. So the index value is equals to OD value for negative control divided by mean cutoff value. In our test run we got the value of 0 0.1320 which will be divided by our mean cutoff value that is 0.696 so we will get the value of 0.1 which will be in the range of our valid criteria. Failure of any of these quality controls to meet up the validity criteria it will indicates a contamination 
and will determine our experiment as invalid. So here the result of the patient sample should not be reported and repeat testing is recommended. Absence or presence of galactomannan antigen in the test samples is determined by calculation of the index of patient sample. So index of OD value for patient sample is divided by the mean cutoff value. For example, the index value that we got is 0 0.729 which is divided by 0 0.696 mean cutoff control and we get the value of 1.04 which is our positive sample. So if any value serum or bile fluid with the index value less than 0 0.50 will be considered as negative for galactomannan antigen and if it is greater than 0 0.50 it will be considered as positive for the galactomannan antigen. So here in this case our range is coming more than 0 0.50 so our test result will be considered as the positive. Here we must remember that if the OD value is less than 0 0.000 then it indicates any kind of instrumental error and we should evaluate that and eradicate that error. Here it must be noted that the positive serum galactomannan result supports the diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis but the negative result does not rule out the invasive aspergillosis. So a repeat testing is always recommended. So now we will just demonstrate uh, to you about the cryptococcal antigen assay uh, that is the cryptococcus biosynx uh, assay which we are doing in detection in our laboratory. So, dear participants, uh, we have observed or uh, we have tried to demonstrate to you uh, the critical steps of um, the uh, beta deglucan assay as well as the galactomannan assay. So, there are a lot of uh, technical technicalities in <clears throat> beta glucan assay. You have to use, you have to be very careful that there is no glucan anywhere. Whenever your surrounding should be uh, in the serology room, preferably has to be a separate room. Most of the um, steps have to be performed within the uh, biosafety cabinet and everything has to be prepared very well. The pipettes for glucan and galactomannan have to be separate. And in case of uh, the galactomannan assay, the critical steps include the um, step of heating using the water bath. So preferred is the dry bath where 120 degrees centigrade is required. But uh, in a resource limited setting, you can always opt for a water bath if it is available with you. So that is the step which is very important because it is the critical step where you're trying to get the galactomannan in the supernatant and you're trying to precipitate other uh, things which can be actually interfering with your results. And uh, another uh, very critical step uh, for the galactomannan assay is your pipetting and the washing step. So most of the time the kit mentions to use a um, washer. 
So washer actually again uh, in resource limited settings uh, every time to depend on a washer. So uh, our um, uh, the uh, supporting staff, our technician has very clearly uh, our uh, resource staff has uh, reported or has told that the results can be very well uh, obtained if you are doing rigorous washing uh, manually and you can prefer to use a multi-channel pipette. So all these techniques have to be very carefully performed and these have to be, and if you, what, uh, if you have observed or not very clearly, the samples initially have to be put in duplicates or triplicates because that way you will be doubly sure that you are not doing any error and cutoffs have to be uh, valid. If you get any invalid result, do not proceed further. You can repeat the test and critical thing again is the sampling. We prefer to get samples two hours before performing either the uh, beta deglucan assay or the galactomin assay. Second very important thing is if you receive samples, you can you have to store it in minus 20. So minus 20 is again a requirement. The freezer is a requirement because you cannot store them at uh, four degrees or you cannot store them at room temperature. So, and the samples that have been sent have to be uh, sent only for these beta deglucan or galactomannan assay. And um, you choose a day which is different, like uh, in a week, at least two days, you can fix for galactomannan assay, two days you can fix for the beta deglucan assay. Why this is a prerequisite is because in, in between you can have good amount of uh, contamination control by fumigation and other steps. At the same time, uh, you can, check the validity of the results and the preparation time you get for other reagents to be or other pipettes, tips, and uh, all these things have to be prepared. And technicality also, the person who is performing these tests have, has to be dedicated and very dedicatedly performing these assays. So that, that is very important. Otherwise, the results are fine. If you, once you have validated, the results will be very good. And if you're not doing uh, or you're taking care of entire uh, thing that is required. So this is how we have finished with our zero diagnosis. So we'll just take a break of five minutes and then we will start with our uh, section B that is the research aspect. Um, so now we take a break. <laughs> 